All right, so today, Professor Eugene Cantor will be giving his third lecture on his three-part series on accounting for Maryland Rebooted. Eugene has taught accounting courses at University of Maryland for many, many years, and he's an expert in accounting as well as law. So today, we're really excited to have him here as a speaker for the third time. And I'm sure you already attended uh, his previous two webinars before that were really engaging and really gave some deep insights into basic accounting systems, how to approach income statements and cash flow. And today, he'll give us some insights on managerial accounting. My name is Nicole Kim, and I'm coordinator for the Maryland Business Recruited Program. And today, Michelle Weddell is also here to help coordinate any questions that you may have for Eugene today. So please stay muted during the lecture, but we welcome any questions that you might have for Eugene. So please use the Q&A section or the chat section, and we will be happy to deliver your questions to Eugene. All right, so without further ado, I'll hand over the floor to Eugene. Great, thanks so much, Nicole. And let me go ahead and uh, share my screen with everybody so you can see it. I wanna thank Nicole for the wonderful jazz music that she provides to start off the uh, class. For those of you who are jazz fans out there, by the way, I don't wanna characterize Ray Charles as just jazz, but uh, if you like jazz, there was a wonderful column on Ray Charles in yesterday's Wall Street Journal. So you might wanna check it out if you're a Ray Charles fan as, as I am. So not quite as much fun, I guess, as Ray Charles as accounting and so, uh, this is the last of our modules together and appreciate your coming uh, today. Let's just briefly review what we've covered so far in the uh, prior two modules. You might recall in the first one, we talked about fundamentals of financial accounting, which deals with generally accepted accounting principles. And um, GAAP uh, are standards that are set out, principles set out for the accounting profession uh, when it provides uh, financial information. We talked about the accounting, the accounting conceptual framework where accountants had to design a uh, framework for the way financial information was going to be conveyed primarily for users who are creditors and investors looking to put money into companies either in the forms of loans or equity investments in the form of stock. We talked about the accounting equation. Assets must always equal liabilities plus stockholders equity. And we said that for every asset, there must be an equal source of that asset. And either you've borrowed money to get into your company, you have sold stock, or you have made a profit and kept that uh, profit. That's called retained earnings. And then we talked about the four primary financial statements used by investors and creditors. The income statement, which will give the revenues and expenses for the company, and hopefully it will have income to report on the income statement. The retained earnings or capital statement, which will show the earnings kept in the company, uh, and if it uh, and and what the beginning retained earnings was, plus additions or subtractions in the form of losses or income, and the balance. And if it were a broader statement of capital statement, it would also discuss what happened by way of all of the equity, which would be the capital stock of the company, starting additions and subtractions coming to a final balance. And then the balance sheet, the assets, liabilities, and equity of the company, and finally the cash flow statement. We talked about the accrual accounting method, which recognizes revenue not when money is received for services or for products, but rather when money is earned, must be earned, which means that the services or products have been delivered. And we talked about expenses, which are not when money is spent, but rather when the expenses have been incurred. And that can happen in two ways. Number one, you can purchase something that is by its nature an expense, such as meals for employees. Uh, or supplies that are used immediately, or you could purchase an asset in the form of a machine uh, or equipment, a building, and even supplies that are gonna last. And then as you use those assets, we expense them, removing them from assets, and they become expenses that show up on the income statement. Okay, so that was what we did in our first uh, module. The second module, we went into the cash flow statement in more detail and the we did some financial statement analysis the cash flow statement some people not acquainted with the accrual method would say well wouldn't the income be the same as the cash flow and we said no again with cash flow you're going to receive cash and you're going to spend cash 
when you earn revenue and when you uh, when you have incur expenses, uh, and that's when you'll recognize them under the cash flow under the cash method of accounting. But under accrual accounting, again, there's there are different there are different criteria that we use. The criteria again: the revenue when earned, the expenses when incurred. So we reconciled the differences between the cash method and the accrual method to see how they differ and to be able to explain the differences in income under the cash method and um, income under the uh, accrual method of accounting. And you'll be interested to know that today we'll talk a little bit from tax standpoint of the actual benefits of the cash method uh, for tax purposes, but we indicated in the last seminar that we there were benefits to the accrual method of accounting for financial accounting purposes. And of course you may use either uh, or both methods. You can use a uh, cash method or accrual in your financial statements and you can use cash or accrual for uh, tax and they don't have to be the same. They can be, uh, they can be different. So you can use cash for one method, accrual for the other. And cash is generally gonna be better you'll see for tax purposes. And then finally, we performed some ratio analysis. We looked at um, the uh, liquidity ratios that determine whether the company is properly liquid enough to be able to meet its obligations as they come due. And we talked about the debt paying ability of the company, some debt ratios, profitability measures, and uh, talked a little bit about how you have to be careful with financial statement analysis. There are limitations to it, but we generally use it for trend analysis, see how the company might be doing year to year, and also comparing the company's operations uh, against similarly situated companies uh, and by using the, um, these various ratios that we talked about. So what are we gonna do today? Today, we're gonna to talk uh, about, a little bit about the uh, tax issues associated with COVID-19, uh, as well as for those of you who may have had loans, uh, getting uh, reimbursed for those loans, uh, or not, you know, basically not having to pay back the loan. We'll talk also about uh, some payroll tax issues. We'll actually cover that first, and then we will go into managerial accounting. Now, managerial accounting is different from financial accounting. It is used, it is accounting information that is used by managers running a business, as opposed to financial accounting, which is primarily used by creditors and investors when deciding to make loans or make investments in companies. Managerial accounting is extremely important for running a business. It's, it's a very useful, um, very useful material to know and understand, not just from the standpoint of the accountant. A lot of times my students will say to me, well, aren't I gonna have an accountant, you know, help me run my business? And I tell them, well, you know, I don't think you wanna delegate everything. The decision-making process is not gonna be delegating that to the accountant. So an understanding of what managerial accounting information means to your business is extremely important for making decisions as how to, to run your business. So we'll get into primary areas I wanted to cover today. will be understanding your cost structure of your business, and some basic budgeting uh, uh, material, and also talk about relevancy. We're looking at for relevant information in decision making. Okay, so let's take a look at today's materials, and you should have these available to you uh, in the uh, links that have been provided. Let's talk first about some uh, some tax credit issues, tax strategies in time of COVID and loan forgiveness. Now, I just want to mention that, of course, everyone's situations differ. So I don't want you to take this as tax advice. I call this resources for COVID-19 tax breaks for small business, mainly to provide you with uh, some ideas, uh, issues to think about in conjunction with your tax professional uh, and just make you aware of, of uh, various opportunities that could minimize uh, taxation for you. To start out with, I've given you here an IRS COVID-10 resource page. And uh, let me go ahead and show you what that is. This is an IRS website, which is extremely useful. And it will provide information specifically aimed at tax relief for businesses and tax exempt entities. This is constantly going to be updated. So you may want to, uh, you know, surf around it, looking at the various uh, materials that they have set up here. Employee retention credit, we'll talk briefly about that. Uh, there's also the uh, related paid sick leave worker for sick leave for workers, tax credits for small and mid sized businesses. 
a little bit on net operating loss carrybacks. C corporations will talk about these subjects. Payroll support, uh, let's see, that's more limited. But it's a good, useful, uh, I think, uh, resource page uh, for you to, uh, to take a look at if you're interested in more detail on some of the tax aspects we're going to talk about today. OK, so with that, the family, Families First Coronavirus Response Act, you can see here, otherwise affectionately known as the FFCRA, provides small and mid-sized employers with a refundable tax credit to reimburse them dollar for dollar for the cost of providing sick leave, family leave to their employees uh, that's related to COVID-19. I should point out here that you'll notice that we're talking about uh, a refundable credit. Now, what does that mean? Well, credits can be refundable or non-refundable. A non-refundable credit would mean that you need to owe taxes to get the reimbursement. So when you're filing your tax return, there's a tax balance due uh, for the year. You owe taxes of some amount during the year and you can apply that credit to reduce that tax uh, liability. Refundable credits means that you could actually show a loss and still receive the credit. So the best, of course, is refundable. You don't have to have a tax amount. Uh, and I'm not saying a tax amount that's owed on your final return. I mean a tax amount owed for the year at any point in the year or for the, for the balance of the year, uh, the entire year, if you come up with a tax liability of some kind that you have to pay, uh, the credit may be offset against that. And if you don't have that, if you have a net loss, you still get the refund based on the credit. The eligible businesses, fewer than 500 employees, let's see, oops. And um, it's again for paid sick and family medical leave related to COVID-19, either for the employee's own health needs or to care for family members. Workers may receive up to 80 hours of paid sick leave for not only their own health needs, but to care for others and up to an additional 10 weeks of paid family leave uh, to uh, care for a child whose school or place uh, of care is closed or child care provider is closed or unavoidable due to COVID-19 precautions. And it also covers the cost of this paid leave by providing small businesses again with the refundable tax credits. Now there's a requirement that employers provide paid leave through two separate provisions. Paid Sick Leave Act entitles workers to up to 80 hours of paid sick leave when they're unable to work for certain reasons related to COVID-19. And the Emergency Family and Medical Leave Expansion Act, which entitles workers for certain paid family and medical leave. Again, fully refundable credits available to cover the cost of leave required to be paid for these periods of time during which employees are unable to work. Again, the eligible employers are entitled to receive the credit in the full amount of the qualified sick leave wages and qualified family leave wages, plus allocable qualified health care uh, plan expenses and the employee's share of Medicare tax paid for leave during the period beginning April 1, 2020 through December 31, 2020. So just again, note that there are these refundable credits, this obligation also to provide paid family and sick leave. Uh, under the uh, under the law. Let's talk about a few tax strategies that uh, will might be useful as a result of uh, the pandemic. Normally, the we are not permitted to deduct uh, losses on the return uh, that are covered by insurance. Uh, the code lets individuals and businesses claim these losses again, not covered by insurance on the prior year's federal tax return to get the money quickly to the victims of a, um, uh, a, a uh, casualty loss. Um, and so the intent uh, allows them then to immediately file and receive the money quicker than they might otherwise by having to wait until they, until, um, uh, for, for them to file their current return and uh, get an offset of their uh, taxes as a result. Now, disaster declarations are usually for events like hurricanes or earthquakes. This year, the pandemic qualifies 
So for example, a restaurant owner who had a good year in 2019 might be able to deduct 2020 pandemic expenses for food spoilage, be a good example of it, of uh, the type of damage you might be looking at. So it's a good idea to think about if you have had damage as a result of pandemic, what might be eligible here. Um, and again, to do this for the a carryback would probably be acquired an amended 2019 tax return Alter, alternately, the losses can be claimed on 2020 returns, which are due as late as October 15, 2021. Now, not all the pandemic costs are going to be deductible. And to be honest, it's not clear yet. That's why I gave you the resource page, because they will be updating that for more specificity on the types of expenses as a result of the pandemic that you might be able to get reimbursement for. Now, the way the code works, it's technically a casualty has to be sudden and caused by a disaster. So we're talking here about the loss is closed and completed, meaning done, not ongoing, and from a fixed and determinable event. Here would be the uh, pandemic. Now a revenue drop for a restaurant's probably not gonna count. They're generally gonna require some type of out-of-pocket expense that you've had, not foregone revenue. Uh, rather added costs. For example, deep cleaning or payment to get out of the lease because of pandemic, uh, that possibly could count. Any payments out of pocket costs you have that seem to be directly related to the pandemic itself. Now, some practitioners, I sort of put this in, I think it's a little humorous to me, I just don't see it, but some tax practitioners are advocating the possibility of claiming stock market losses. I really don't think that that's gonna go uh, but they haven't ruled on that specifically, as I understand it, uh, yet. And they haven't been real friendly in terms of letting you know exactly what you're going to be able to deduct. Sometimes the IRS will do that. They keep some vagueness in the tax laws, so people really aren't sure. Believe it or not, that can be done intentionally to make investors more cautious or conservative with their tax filings. Um, now, casualty losses that are greater than 50,000 are gonna require special disclosure on the return, might be referred to as a come audit me provision, but they do wanna have notification of that. So, uh, and it could be an audit trigger if it's uh, you know, over 50,000. The tax overhaul in 2017 ended the ability of firms to use current operating losses to offset prior year's taxes. Now the CARES Act allows a five-year carryback for net losses for 2018, 2019, and 2020. The 27 law also removed other restrictions on their use, or the, I'm sorry, the CARES Act also removed other restrictions on their use, making the provision highly valuable, valuable to some taxpayers. Interestingly, Congress is letting companies get refunds of taxes they paid at 35% corporate rate that existed before 2018, rather than at today's 21% rate. Another strategy is to switch to the cash method of accounting to defer taxes because under accrual, as we talked about in our first module uh, and second module, you can uh, wind up having income before you receive payment if you have earned the income. So the 2017 overhaul allowed firms averaging less than a certain amount of revenue, actually they use the term gross receipts, 25 million, basically the same as revenue uh, or less over the prior three years. So for the prior three years, gross receipt less than 25 million in each, uh, over an average of those three years, you are eligible for cash accounting. Um, and again, so you're not, you wouldn't be owed IRS until customer pay rather than owing when customers commit to pay for the services that you've uh, earned or revenue you've earned from services. And the CARES Act permits employers to defer payment of the remaining 2020 Social Security payroll tax liabilities into 2021 and 2022. This has been controversial because they haven't indicated if it's just gonna be forgiven. Uh, and it's become a bit of a political issue as well. Some have interpreted this as cutting off a source of Social Security, endangering Social Security. Not gonna do that. It's basically an attempt to put more cash immediately into employee hands. Um, and this assistance is delivered through the existing system used by employers to deposit federal payroll taxes. Here's an interesting guide that I uh, also included in the materials, the Wall Street Journal uh, 
small business survival guide. And so you can scan this as well and see if you see anything interesting with respect to your business. And it's a nice resource on different types of uh, aspects of COVID-19 that have affected businesses and possible ways uh, business, other businesses are coping and may have as well some um, tax uh, information in it. So I wanted to throw that in for you. It's a very nice resource that's part of the uh, materials. A little bit on loan forgiveness. If you've gotten loans from uh, the SBA and to meet the requirements for forgiveness, uh, this also has information on the um, payroll, um, you know, limit, reducing the uh, payroll withholding. So here, um, the um, options for borrowers to calculate payroll costs using an alternative payroll covered period that aligns with the borrower's regular payroll cycle. There's flexibility to include eligible payroll and non-payroll expenses paid or incurred during the 24 week period after receiving the PPP loan. And you have step-by-step -step instructions on how to perform the calculations required by the CARES Act to conform eligibility or loan forgiveness. I've given you a calculator for that, which has got directions on it, instructions on it that you can use to determine uh, what type of reimbursements you might be eligible for, depending on the nature of the uh, expenses you've had related to the loan. Also borrower friendly implementation of statutory exemptions for loan forgiveness reduction based on rehiring by December 31, 2020 and addition of a new exemption for loan forgiveness reduction for borrowers. So all of this uh, is included in the uh, PPP um, loan forgiveness uh, statutory provisions. Here's a, another resource for you, guidance issued in imp to implement presidential memorandum deferring social security tax withholding, as I was mentioning here, you can do that uh, abatement if you want. It is, there are some issues associated with it. Let me uh, split up here. This is a PDF. This is the most recent, as far as I know, with respect to relief, with respect to employment tax deadlines applicable to employers uh, who are affected by the ongoing coronavirus COVID-19 disease pandemic. Now this is uh, an interesting issue. It, there's really not a lot of clarification on it. So you can defer the social security withholding beginning March 27, 2020 and ending December 31, 2020. 50% must be paid by December 31, 2021 as of right now. Again, Trump administration's indicating they're looking for forgiveness of this. It does raise a number of issues. Employers who elect to defer the withholding of the employee's social security and Medicare taxes from September 1 until the end of 2020 are required to pay that back next year by over withholding on those same employees. I'm not sure what happens if the employees leave though. If Congress does not forgive the payback, those deferred taxes, the employers uh, could find themselves on the hook. The risk is significant because if an employee were to leave, the employer would not be able to withhold taxes from later paychecks. On the other hand, an interesting issue, how will it look for, if an employer does not defer the Congress and Congress forgives the payback? Will Congress retroactively give the employees the tax not deferred? In other words, will they say, all right, well, you can now go back um, and uh, you know, they, they, you've wound up paying it, can you get that money back? Unclear. And these provisions apply to employees making less than $104,000 in annualized wages. So that's a provision that we're watching and it's just unclear how it's gonna play out. And unfortunately you have to kind of make decisions about it now. So admittedly that does raise some problems. Okay, so that's kind of a brief overview just to give you some ideas of the kinds of tax issues we see associated with COVID-19 uh, pandemic and um, what, uh, how it might affect your business. It's very complicated area. You can see there are lots of unanswered questions associated with it. I don't envy business owners when there is vagary, especially with respect to the tax laws, but it just gives you sort of a feel of what's, uh, what's going on. Let me stop there and see if there are any questions.
Okay. So let's move on now to the last area. And we're talking here about using managerial accounting information in business. Now, this is an area, as I mentioned, of accounting that deals with accounting information that is used by managers to manage their business. This is an area that I feel all business managers should have substantial knowledge on. And the reason for that is that while an accountant can provide you with this information, number one, it can be misleading. Sometimes you don't really understand the numbers. You can be misled to some extent by the uh, information that you're seeing. And I'll explain that a little bit later. In addition, you're the one who's making the decision. So when you get the information, it's very helpful to understand the nature of it and, and not be fooled again by uh, sometimes the information not, you know, being fully understandable. I think, uh, can yeah. I interrupt you there? So there's a question uh, from Alicia. Uh, so does your PPP calculator work for a single member LLC or sole proprietors? I believe it does. It's, um, it's, it's based on just the uh, employees that you've employed. Uh, and I don't believe it's limited to corporations. Um, Okay, so what, is, as I mentioned, so managerial accounting is going to be, oh, and I should mention they're pretty, pretty um, detailed instructions that walk you through how to use it, the uh, calculator. Um, so again, managerial accounting, accounting information that is used by business managers in making decisions. I should, I should mention that, um, when we're talking about this, inf this, this accounting information, this, this the, again, the accountant's gonna provide it, but an understanding of it is extremely useful to the decision-making process and you're the one making the decision. So we don't have, what I like about this accounting, I call it the Ferrari of accounting, whereas I think the generally accepted accounting principles of financial accounting is like a nice, and I'm not, saying this in any disparaging way, because I've owned several of these. If you have a nice uh, Toyota Camry, that's a good car. I had, I've used several of them in my lifetime and they've been very reliable, very nice. We have generally accepted accounting principles to make sure that the outside users, the creditors and the, um, the creditors and the investors, uh, you know, are not misled, they're outsiders of the business. So we need to have principles and standards that make sure they're not misled. I call managerial accounting the Ferrari of accounting. And the reason I call it that is you can do anything you want. You know, if you own a Ferrari, the rules of the road do not apply to you. I know this because I have oftentimes been passed by Ferraris uh, on the road. And I know that the road rules, apparently the speed limits do not apply to people who own Ferraris and drive them, right? They, they're not subject to that. I haven't looked at law, but I'm assuming that's the case. Well, that's kind of what managerial accounting is. It's anything you want to get, the accountant will get you, ad hoc reports, et cetera. Now, there are certain types of reports that are recommended and used in managerial accounting, but again, because you're management or you own your company, you're an insider and you're much less likely to be misled, especially if you have a knowledge of managerial accounting. So that is what makes it more fun, more useful. There are no rules. It's like the Ferrari of accountants. All right, so what we're, we're gonna focus on is understanding your basic cost structure, why that's important. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about different types of costs that you should keep an eye on, what relevant costs are when you make a decision based upon costs, and then a little bit about budgeting. All right, so here's a little uh, discussion here. What is cost? Why do you want to know? It depends. So one might think, well, okay, cost is obviously what my product costs me, right? I mean, I don't think that that's anything that's crazy. I mean, what, what, what's so unique about managerial accounting that cost, it, it, the answer to the question, what is the cost of something? Uh, the answer to the question is, why do you want to know? And the, uh, the uh, answer to that is, it depends on why you want to know. 
Now, here's how you can get in trouble. And it's illustrated by not knowing your cost structure. It's illustrated by this uh, little case. So let's take a look. This is called the uh, Disputed Marriott Hotel over the cost of employee benefits. So you may decide you want to provide benefits to your employees. And you may even write it up as a contract agreement, right? Consult a lawyer, say, this is what I want to provide to my employees. And then the question is, how is the contract interpreted? So this little case goes like uh, with the following. We have a dispute at the Marriott Hotel about the implementation of part of a labor department agreement. Now, the disputed part involves a clause that states workers shall receive free a meal, one meal per shift up to a cost of $12. Simple enough, right? Cost of $12. Any cost over the $12 for the meal is going to be deducted from the wages paid to the employees. Simple enough. Now the kitchen workers who ate dinner on the late shift found that their wages were reduced by $10 for each meal they consumed at the hotel during their dinner break. Hmm. So that to me would mean that the cost of the meal must have been $22, right? Because they're gonna get $12 free, anything over that they get deducted, and they've had their wages reduced by $10, so they had a $22 meal. Josh Parker, a line cook, stated the widely held belief that the workers, there's no way these dinners cost the Riverside Hotel, the Marriott Hotel, $12 to make, let alone 22. This is just another case of management trying to rip us off. Take last night, I had a prime rib dinner. The meat cost $7, right? So that's seven, okay. Salad, less than a dollar, that's eight. So according to this worker, Josh Parker, the meal cost $8 and the benefit is 12. So they're $4 under what the Marriott contract said that they would do. Management of Riverside Hotel looks at the situation differently. The manager of the hotel says, that dinner goes for 32 on the menu. So assigning a $22 cost represents a very good value. In fact, it's really $10 uh, savings, right? The, the goes for 32, we're only providing a cost of 22. That's $10 over the 12 that we said we would give you. Consider the arguments on both sides to determine the fair price that should be used for determining the cost of a meal. So with this information, who's right? So take, take five minutes and think about whether Marriott's right in charging the $10. They say they could charge 20, that the meal goes for 32 and they said we'd give you a meal that costs 12. Why would Marriott say, by the way, that the meal goes for 32? That's not the cost. Well, that's the cost of the customer, right? Not Marriott. So why would they think that's relevant? So take five minutes and I'm giving you places here to put down management position, the computation, and you, can, you don't have to accept 32. You could accept any other cost that you want. And then think about from an employee perspective, what did, what's reasonable for them to expect based on these facts. Gene, you want participants to type some answers in the uh, chat box? Sure, that would be great. I'm gonna try that. Let's see, I can bring up the chat too here, right? I see it, let's see. Yeah. Yeah, if you wanna take a stab at it.
I can even be the judge. <laughs> Find my robe. We have one answer by uh, Ali. Ali okay. Let's see here. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I see a uh, computation here. Is that right? X for the cost of labor plus benefits. X for the cost of the facility. X for the cost of utilities. Mm-hmm. So the key there is, um, and it's a good one, that labor's view of cost might be rather narrow, right? And labor is basically saying here, well, the meat costs $7 and the salad one. So we're really talking here about $8 in direct materials, right? And the that view might be pretty narrow because didn't they have to cook the steak right and so they have other costs associated with the production of the meal that are beyond just direct costs a lot of times people think of cost as being the direct cost what's the amount that it costs me but in fact there may be other costs involved as well Mana mentions uh, opportunity cost. Mm -hmm. The opportunity cost is, a, is very relevant also, certainly from Marriott's standpoint, what they're saying here is, well, we could have sold it for $32, right? I mean, what happens, in fact, if we wind up being out of them, a customer comes in and orders that steak, and we don't have it because the employees have eaten it. And we could have sold it for $32. And that's right, that's an opportunity cost, which can be relevant and reasonably used as the cost by Marriott, right? Especially if, let's say you go in there and they're out of those stakes, you might never go back to Marriott, which would be a cost as well. So Mark, Mark says that the management computation could be retail price minus profit margin. Could be, yep, could base it on that. You could say, uh, you could use either the retail price itself or you could say, well, okay, we'll, we'll take out what the profit margin is on that. And that would be the cost if it's over the uh, $12, we would bill you for the difference. Mm -hmm. That's a reasonable way to look at it as well. And Steve says Marriott must provide a meal that costs the employee $12. Um, well, the way they phrase this, they're just saying that you can order a meal up to 12. Uh, yeah, you think they should have meals on the menu that are no greater than 12, right? That the employees could choose. It'd be kind of unfair if all the meals were starting at $20, then the employees know they're gonna have to pay a minimum of eight. <laughs> you can see that this way that this, um, provision by Mary or this offer by Mary to stated, it's very vague, right? It's what is cost? And there are different ways that we could look at cost here. So there's one, I, one hmm. question by, by Mark. Uh, he asks, is the opportunity cost equal to the profit margin? The opportunity cost would be what they forego by, by not making the sale. So yeah, if the cost is 32, if I'm sorry, if the, if the uh, price is 32 and it costs them, let's say $10 to produce the, the steak, then they lose $22 in profit, right? So that's what would be the relevant cost to them. Any other thoughts? So this 
this illustration is intended really to show you how um, it's, and it can apply, you know, can get you in trouble if you have a legal document out there that when it comes to costing a product, there are more considerations than just what you, you know, to just stating a cost thinking probably here, the employees thought, well, cost means, you know, whatever additional cost it is to buy, you know, the direct materials, right? The steak itself and the salad, the mixes for the salad. Whereas Marriott's thinking much broader than that. And a big misunderstanding like this can really cost you in terms of your relationship with your employees and can get you into some legal trouble as well. This is where I say an understanding of managerial accounting is important um, at, because it can, you can look at numbers and if you don't understand what they mean or how to interpret them, properly define them, you can really get yourself in trouble. Um, a good illustration of this is actually something that uh, happened to me many, many years ago uh, when I was with uh, an investment banking firm and we had an employee who wanted to buy some stock for his uh, daughter who had just been born. And so uh, he, uh, we had a brokerage firm as one of our businesses and he came to us and submitted an application to buy the stock through the broker. This was back when brokerage commissions were fairly significant. I think it was eight to 10% or something in buying shares of a mutual fund. Well, we were, uh, as a broker, we weren't the clearing broker. So we had to split the commission, which was 8%. And so we would get 4% commission on it. The other 4% would go to the clearing broker on the transaction. And so he uh, submitted it, we processed it. And then he came into my office and he said, you know, I'd like to get the 4% back. And I said, what do you mean get back the 4%? And he said, well, you get 4% right from the transaction. And I said, yeah. And he said, well, it doesn't cost you anything, right? You just, you just hand it over to the clearing broker. So aren't I gonna get that back as a courtesy? And I said, no. And I said, well, first of all, it's not true that it doesn't cost us anything. Where do you think this equipment come from to execute all of this? And he said, well, you've already paid for that, right? And I said, well, yeah, but that doesn't mean that we don't allocate part of the cost to that. Um, and, you know, it was sort of a misunderstanding. There was nothing that we had promised that they would get free brokerage. We were a relatively new firm at the time that employees would get free brokerage. He just kind of assumed that it would be. So the point of the story is, again, what is cost? It's true that maybe there wasn't an incremental cost associated, meaning an additional cost associated with executing those trades through the clearing broker. But nonetheless, a reasonable case could be made that in fact, there was a cost, right? The machinery and, and salary and time of, of employees would reasonably be allocated to the uh, cost of the, um, of, of the execution of the trade. So we settled on it and you know, we said, okay, we'll give you a break, but we're not gonna give you the full 4% back. So you could write down all kinds of things here again by management. We could say, as we mentioned, uh, that it would be the, uh, the full, mm -hmm. question, Sorry. Michelle? There's one, one, uh, one answer by, by Steve says, the cost of the food plus an allocation of the cost to prepare the meal. Yeah, I think that's uh, very reasonable that Marriott could take that position. Uh, they could say the opportunity cost if they want, but right, they could say, all right, just as a story, uh, we'll, we'll start here at the, with the cost of the direct materials, which we said was $8, we'll agree to that. But then we have to make allocations for overhead, right? Overhead are all of your indirect costs. So we would not only, we could, we could conceivably talk about some of the equipment, that would be really what we call a fixed overhead item, that would be depreciation. We'd say, okay, there, we're going to allocate a portion of the equipment cost, you know, for the, um, the ovens and everything. There's also variable overhead. These are indirect costs. They're not directly associated with the product, but they could be allocated to the product. And we would include there uh, the uh, salary of the people doing the serving. You know, maybe they're taking 10%, 20% of their time serving the employees. It would be reasonable to allocate some of that cost as well. The employees, of course, would want to stick with the direct cost. That would be what their position would likely be. Again, the seven plus one, which would be the, uh, be the eight. And again, Marriott could take the position all the way up to $32 in terms of the opportunity cost. Okay. Um, 
So those, that again, just to tell you that, that an understanding of your cost structure is extremely important uh, to get yourself, keep yourself out of trouble here. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the TV show Restaurant Impossible uh, on the Food Channel. But it's a, it's a program that's very, it really is a managerial accounting course in some ways where the uh, head of the show will go into these restaurants and they're all failing. They're all disgusting. I mean, they have, they have health violations, but he'll go and ask them, you know, well, what do you charge for, let's say, a, 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 you know, a glass of scotch? And they'll come up with a price. How'd you get that price? Well, the bottle cost me a certain amount of money. And uh, so I just divide that by the number of drinks I get out of the bottle and then I mark it up maybe 10%. Well, they haven't thought about allocations to the cost of a bottle besides just the direct materials. Again, you have the bar, you have rent on the place, you have a waitress who'd be serving, server. So again, there are all kinds of other costs that need to be considered when you determine what the cost is of a particular product you might be uh, creating. This is also a useful way to think about things. We'll talk a little bit about if you get involved in bidding on contracts, what's the lowest that you can go? Well, again, what is your actual cost? Then do I include all the overhead? And again, the answer as usual is it depends. Depends on the nature of the bid and what your objection, objectives are. All right, so just sort of a little whet your appetite um, hors d'oeuvre there. So let's talk about costs of running a business. And normally you talk, we talk about fixed, variable, and mixed costs. Fixed costs are costs that remain fixed in total, regardless of the level of production and vary per unit. And we're talking here about salaries and rent that are a fixed dollar amount, no matter what your level of production happens to be. So that's why we say they're fixed in total. Maybe your rent uh, for your factory or your restaurant is, let's say, $10,000 a month. Now, it doesn't matter how, how late you stay open. That $10,000 a month doesn't change, right? Now, when I say the cost per unit, let's say you're serving 1,000 people. Okay, so a thousand people served at a ten thousand dollar cost, ten dollars per person, right? Is the cost of the rent if you wanted to make the allocation. If you kick that up to twenty thousand, though, and you're doing, you're uh, talking about. I'm sorry, you went the opposite way. Your cost stays the same, right? So we're looking here at a $10,000 cost, but now we're gonna kick it up to 20,000 people that you're serving. So now we're, we're looking at $5 per person, right? So it cuts the cost per unit in half by doubling the number of units that are being created as a result of that fixed cost. So the fixed cost again can be different per unit, but it's always going to be the same in total. The variable costs kind of are the mirror image of that. The variable costs are vary based on production, remain constant per unit. So if a unit costs me, let's say $5 to manufacture in direct materials. So the amount of material that I use, the cost of the material is $5, maybe per shirt. No matter how many units I manufacture, it's $5 per unit. The cost in total will vary in proportion to the number of units manufactured. Manufacture one unit, my total cost is $5. Manufacture two units, my total cost is $10. So there is an increase in total, whereas for fixed cost, the total doesn't change. For variable, it does in proportion to the number of units manufactured or created. And at the same time, if I increase my production level, the total cost goes up, but the unit cost stays the same. So some examples there, again, materials, if you're paying somebody by the hour, and variable overhead. Overhead is an interesting concept, and it can be sometimes difficult to understand. 
when we talk about direct costs, whether you're manufacturing or producing a service, you're talking about costs, again, uh, that are easily traceable to the product. So typically materials, you know, how many materials you used, how much in the way of materials you use to produce a meal, for example, a specific meal, or if you're a restaurant, or if you're a manufacturing facility, particular units of your product. Same with wages. We can directly trace the wages that we're paying to the product. So those are easy. We don't have to worry about allocating those because we can directly trace to individual products. On the other hand, your overhead, not so easy. A good explanation of overhead uh, is um, when I have a, a meal with my, my retired friends. They're all retired from the federal government. I went to teach in my retirement. They always look at me and tease me and say, what did you do wrong, Gene, that we're retired and you're, you know, you're still working? And I say, well, when a young person passes you, you guys, and you know, you know, you're walking somewhere, and there's a couple of young people maybe going by, you know, do they acknowledge you or anything? And they say, no, they don't even see us. And so I tell them, well, you know, when I pass young people, like who are my students and all, they notice me because I just say to them, you know, um, if you uh, if you don't notice me or listen to me, the test is going to be made much harder right? Don't say hello to me, or if I'm in class, all I have to say is this is going to be on the exam, right? So they kind of shrug and look at me and say, okay, well, okay, maybe that's one of the benefits. Young people notice you and talk to you. But anyway, back to my meal. So we order meal and we order a pitcher of beer. We go to lunch together and the check comes and they say, okay, let's just split it. And I always say to them, why would I split it? And they say, well, Gina, just be easier, wouldn't it, if we split it and say, I know what I ordered. I ordered a bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwich, right? And I can see what the menu price is, and I can put my um, tip on top of that. So I'm not planning to split it with you guys. And then they always turn to me and they say, well, what about the beer? And I think, uh, the beer, that's right, the beer. How do I know how much beer I had? How do, how do I know how much of the beer I should pay for, right? And so, again, they say, let's split. And I say, no, I don't want to split it. I don't like splitting it. I want to pay for what I ordered. And so we have to come up with a way to figure out who had how much beer. So I'll usually say, well, how about we base it on how many times we filled our cups or glasses? And then they'll say, well, how do you know, some people fill it at halfway. Some people fill it when, when the, the drink is, when the glass is empty. Can't do it that way. So some people propose a breathalyzer test, but I don't like that because I'm a fairly small person. And so mine would probably be higher than their, their breathalyzer tests are. So you got to come up with some way to allocate the overhead because that can't be directly traced. And that's the big mistake people make in that restaurant impossible. So that's why knowing, understanding how your business costs operate, critically important to be able to determine what your direct costs are and then work on your, you know, figure out ways to allocate the indirect costs. Sometimes it's done by direct labor hours, the number of hours it took of direct labor to manufacture a unit. They might say, well, for every dollar we spend on direct labor, we'll allocate 25 cents for these indirect costs. Overhead costing is the most difficult part of figuring out what your actual costs are to manufacture your product. Another concept is the concept of sunk costs. And this is a psychological issue for many of us to understand what sunk costs are and to recognize the fact that these costs are completely irrelevant to any business decision. And this is where a lot of businesses go wrong is by worrying about the sunk cost. The typical example is someone who goes out, let's say, and buys a car and the car turns out to be a complete and utter lemon. And they maybe paid fifteen, twenty thousand dollars for the car. And they say, I have to use this car because I paid fifteen, twenty thousand dollars for the car. I can't walk away from that money. I can't sell it for that. So I have to use it, you know, over the next period of time. Uh, maybe three, four years before I can turn it in. That way I won't show a loss, right? Well, the correct way to analyze that situation is not, what are you gonna do about the $15,000 you paid? That's gone. 
that is a sunk cost, right? So you have to ignore it. You have to force yourself to ignore it. Psychologically, you don't want to, but you must. The question really is, what can I sell that car for? And with that money, can I afford to buy a car that will work better for me than the one I have now? Another example, classic, of the sunk cost is the situation where you buy a stock. So maybe you buy the stock at $100 a share. As soon as you buy it, it starts going down. 90, 80, 70, 60. You're gonna hold on to that stock because you don't wanna sell it and incur a loss, right? But at any level, when you're making that decision, you must force yourself to ignore what you paid for the stock and ask yourself, let's say the stock's only worth 60 <coughs> right now, to say to yourself, where would that $60 be better placed? With a stock I have or with another stock? You must ignore what you paid for it. This is a very difficult thing for us to do. We don't want to admit we're wrong or our decision was bad. Many businesses take into account the sunk costs, but you shouldn't. So the cost of machinery, any depreciation you're showing on the um, machine or equipment, irrelevant to your decision. The last example I'll give you is this, I once had a class uh, where I, was, I asked if anybody, or I was gonna give an exa this example relating to scalping a ticket for a sporting event. And I actually had a student raise his hand and said, you know, I actually do scalp. I'm a professional scalper, which I thought was kind of interesting. So we talked about it. And, and again, the same idea with respect to sunk cost for scalping a ticket. Maybe you pay $50 for a Super Bowl ticket and you're going to sell it for $300, right? Can't seem to sell it for 300. You start dropping the price. And then of course, you know, the ticket's pretty much worthless when the ball, when the kickoff starts. So again, you have to ignore what you paid for it and try to get what you can uh, because the sunk cost, what you paid for the tickets completely irrelevant. Okay, so again, the fair market value at any moment in time is what's gonna be relevant to your decision. Opportunity costs also a very interesting consideration for any business. The opportunity cost is revenue that's given up while deciding to engage in an activity. So for example, taking one job over another or operating a machine rather than selling the machine is an opportunity cost. The opportunity cost you give up to operate an old machine, let's say, is what you give up by not being able to sell it for what it's worth today. So the question is always gonna be, do I wanna replace that machine? Well, again, what you paid for, it's not relevant. Whatever depreciation you recognize on the machine, not relevant. What you could sell it for and what you could replace it with would be relevant. Another example, you're interviewing for two different jobs. One job pays 50,000, one job pays 60,000. They have different benefits. If you take job number one, you have to forego job number two, right? That's your opportunity cost. If you take job number two, you have to forego job number one. That's your opportunity cost. These costs, by the way, are always relevant in a decision. A typical factory example would be you're using factory space to manufacture a product. If you could rent that factory space, you have to consider that in a decision that you make because by shutting down the product line and renting, that might be a better alternative than foregoing the rent that you could get by shutting the product down, instead keep manufacturing. Now, full cost is an interesting uh, concept versus incremental. And this is where job bidding comes in or when you're bidding for a job, the full cost includes all of the costs to produce your product. So if you're manufacturing a product, you're talking about your direct materials, your direct labor, both of which are directly traceable to the product, and then your overhead, your indirect costs, which again, we mentioned, you typically have your indirect labor and indirect materials and your other overhead costs like rent. Those are not directly traceable and have to be allocated to the product. So let's say that there's a, a bid opportunity for you and you want to go ahead and place the lowest bid possible to get the, uh, to win the bid. Well, what costs are relevant? So when you're looking at a bidding process, you must cover, every business must cover all of its costs to stay in business, obviously. But sometimes you might figure if I get this job, it'll lead to other jobs. There's some intangible reasons why you want to get it. So in the short term, short term decision making, we typically only look at our incremental costs. Increment, incremental costs are costs that are additional costs, variable costs 
involved for the product. And these are always going to be relevant to any decision that you make. So what's involved in full costing that you wouldn't consider? Your fixed costs. Your fixed costs you're going to incur no matter what. So if you're bidding on something and you want to get that bid in the short term, it's important for you to win the bid. Your fixed costs are really not going to be relevant to the lowest bid you can go because of the fact that you're going to incur them whether you do this job or not. That makes them irrelevant. Any cost or revenue that is the same between two decisions is irrelevant. We only look at differential costs, which are incremental costs. So this is, again, a fallacy that a lot of business people engage in. I'll, I'll tell you a, a story I was reading in the Wall Street Journal many years ago about General Motors. And the article indicated that General Motors lost money every time they sold a car. And I thought to myself, wow, that's unbelievable. Every time they sell a car, they lose money. How can that be? So I went ahead and I called up the, um, I called up the president of General Motors and strangely picked up the phone and I introduced myself, told him I was a professor at the uh, University of Maryland. And I said, you know, I just read in the Wall Street Journal that you lose money every time you sell a car. And I was kind of blown away by that. And I asked him, how much money do you make? And he said, as, as a CEO of, G, of, of GM, he said, I make $40 million a year. I said, that's a lot of money. And you're losing money every time you sell a car. So I said, for $10 million, I will tell you what you should do. And it'll be good advice in terms of, you know, saving the company. And he said, okay, uh, what's, your, what's your advice? And I told him, stop selling cars, okay? And then he hung up the phone. So the moral of the story is, was GM really losing money every time they sold a car? And the answer is, well, maybe in the long run, but not in the short run. GM had factories, right? And they had rent that they were paying. They were paying people salaries. Some they're paying wages. All of these completely irrelevant to cars that they have in production for this year, because they're going to pay those costs anyway, regardless of whether uh, they uh, do the additional manufacturing or not. They are locked in to the factory rent. They're locked into the salaries. They're locked into their other fixed costs. So yeah, they can't sell the car. Maybe they couldn't sell the car for the full cost but they sure could sell the car for less than the incremental cost. Now you can't survive in the long run, again, not covering all of your costs, but in the short run, you're, you're, if you're making a short term decision, your fixed costs are irrelevant, just like they are in the bidding process. Again, if it's important to get the bid and you're willing to take, you know, you want to, you want to service anything that in the long run costs you more than both, but in the short run, for other reasons, intangible reasons, you only look at your incremental costs. Okay, I'll stop there and see if there are any questions. So the, the moral of the story is, I guess, to try to get a handle on your costs, understand how they work, so you can evaluate and determine what your product is actually costing, whether it's a service or a manufactured product. And that also helps you to evaluate the relationship with your customers and determine which customers may be more profitable than others or which customers you might be serving at an actual loss. <clears throat> okay, let's move on to budgeting, our last area. And hopefully you do budget. It's extremely important for businesses to budget. Why is it important for businesses to budget? Well, a number of reasons. One, budgeting gives you an opportunity to control costs because you start out with your desired cost, your budgeted cost on the one hand, and then you can actually make comparisons when you compare your budgeted with your actual numbers. And you ask questions like, well, I was supposed to pay $5 per shirt for cotton that I was manufacturing, wound up paying six, why is that? What caused that difference to come about? It can also, raise issues. What do I mean by that? Well, you're budgeting and you look like you're gonna you know, purchase a certain amount of cotton for your manufacturing. You might say, wow, we're projecting sales such that our manufacturing is gonna require this amount of cotton. 
we don't have access to that amount of cotton right now. We better find other sources. So budget will flesh out issues for you. Uh, you may come up with costs while you're doing your budget that you might not think of if you're not actually sitting down and putting pen to paper trying to figure out what is our budget. So issue, issue identification, very important part of budgeting and controlling and looking for variances and the reasons for variances from what you anticipated through your budget to what you actually in fact wound up spending. So in terms of developing standard costs, develop to calculate and interpret variances for direct material and direct labor typically, you're gonna say again, what are the costs that I wanna pay, that I expect to pay, that are reasonable to pay, and then you make that comparison and you flush out those variances and you try to determine uh, why they happened. Now, sometimes you have to be very careful here. There's a concept in management and uh, management accounting. Uh, and it's, we say it's, you get what you, what you get, what you measure. You get what you measure. And this is important for performance management for your employees. And at the same time, important for your, the incentives that you give employees. So if I say to someone, for example, that I want you to bring in the materials for our product at $10 a pound or less, right? So what can happen is that's the incentive. That's what the employee's performance is gonna be based on. And as a result, it's entirely possible that the employee is gonna go out by the cheapest type of cotton or whatever the product is. And at the, at the same time, maybe low quality. So what happens is maybe I get cheap, the cheap uh, material on the one hand, but then I use a lot more of it because it's poor quality, right? So you have to be very careful with the performance standards you use to measure your employee performance. As you set that up, it could have unintended consequences. You get what you measure. Okay, and then we calculate, as I mentioned, we make comparisons between the budget and then what the actual performance happens to be. So here's a little budget that actually uh, my wife put me on. There was a place located near the University of Maryland when I was on the adjunct faculty there, I'd go have dinner and I just was hooked on this place, Rugged Warehouse, which still has some places around, but unfortunately the one at Maryland went uh, out of business or they pulled it. So uh, every day I was, go I teach two days a week at night, I have dinner, I go into Rugged, and Rugged sold, I couldn't believe the prices for athletic equipment. I mean, t-shirts were, the, I looked so great in the gym in these t-shirts, I can't even begin to tell you. Colors, beautiful stuff. And so, really cheap athletic t-shirts, $4.99 each, premium dress shirts, which meant they had a collar, like a polo shirt, $7.99. And I guess they were probably, you know, seconds, or they were unsold, old, additions, but um, they were great, really great. So I would sneak into the house every night, you know, with a bag, a couple of t-shirts um, or dress shirts. And apparently my drawers were getting so full in, in the bedroom that uh, they were stuffed. And she said, well, what's going on? And I said, oh, I've been getting stuff at this rugged warehouse. And one day she said, she saw me come and said, Jim, we have to put you on a budget. So uh, that's what happens when you're married to uh, an MBA who, uh, was a controller of a federal agency, a budgetary control, the controller. So anyway, so she said, oh, you can have seven a month, but you got to get rid of, for every one you buy, you got to get rid of one. Yeah, I had some old t-shirts, okay, I made that deal. And so you can see here, I could buy four athletic t-shirts, three premium dress shirts, and here were the prices, and so here's my budget. So my question to you is, looking at the budget, what could go wrong? And we're going to really simplify what can go right and wrong? Right and wrong, I mean here, wind up not exceeding my budget, right, spending less than my budget or spending more than my budget. So what do you think could go right or wrong? Right, again, being under budget, wrong being over budget. Looking at this simple budget. And you can type into the chat box if you want. Okay. 
sales. So I could wind up buying more. Oh, sales. Okay, I got you. So in other words, the price. Yeah, there's a price difference, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. So the prices, prices could be higher or lower than the prices indicated in the budget. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts? Yeah, they could have a sale, right? Lower the price. Yeah, quantity. Mm -hmm. I wind up buying five instead of four or two instead of three. Mm -hmm. More or fewer, exactly. By a different mix, that's right. So the quantity would change, right? So there's a third situation and that would be something that's unanticipated in the budget right and by that i mean oh gee i forgot to put in parking or maybe some other cost that i leave out of the budget that's why i say budgets are important for issue identification because when you get it down on paper you might go oh, you know what there's some other costs here we got to include gets you thinking about what you're doing it's a, really what a budget is more than anything else it's a plan and so uh, you want to stick to that. You want to make sure that that plan is reasonable. Mm -hmm. Okay. We'll come back to that in a minute, but basically you, you can see that when we talk about differences in the budgeted actual numbers, we're talking about volume differences, cost price differences, and unanticipated revenues and costs. Those are ways that you can have variances, right, with respect to the budget numbers. Okay, this is the budget process. Everything is driven by the sales budget. So the sales budget, maybe we're projecting we're gonna use 10,000 units or need to, we're gonna sell 10,000 units. We need to produce 10,000 units. Typically you will not stock out. So you'll usually wanna have a production that would be equal to the sales plus any ending inventory you wanted to have. And because you maintain an ending inventory, you would always start with the beginning inventory. So you might say, well, we're gonna have 10,000 units to sell. We wanna have a thousand units left over. So we really need 11,000 but we're gonna start with 500 in our beginning inventory from last period. That's normally how you do it. And then what you'll do is you'll take the numbers here in the production and you'll find it, okay, what do we need to do in terms of our purchases of materials, labor, and overhead? Would be the three costs you'd keep track of. Based on that, again, the sales budget will drive the entire budget process. You'll estimate your selling and administrative expenses as well estimate your cost of goods sold, selling the product and come up with your income statement. You can also create pro forma financial statements, balance sheet, cash flow, et cetera. And you wanna keep track of the cash needs. This is just a very simplified process of how it works. So here's an illustration and it gets back to our concept of costing. And I think you'll find this interesting. The concept deals with what's referred to as the flexible budget. What is a flexible budget? Well, if we have a budget like I did here, and it's based upon a quantity of buying seven, if I buy, let's say six units or five units in actuality, if I compare that to this budget, I would be comparing apples and oranges because this budget is geared towards buying seven. The same with the price. Price might be different as well. Maybe 399, six to 399. It's a different mix here. Somehow I need to conform the master budget, the budget that I'm anticipating with the actual performance budget where I performed. So when you prepare a master budget, you normally wanna have also a flexible budget that takes the master budget numbers 
and says, okay, what would we produce? What would we expect based on the level, the actual level of production based on the master? So again, a master budget based on seven units, we'd need to say, okay, let's use a flexible budget of six if our sales, let's say, were six units instead of seven. And this will become a little clearer, I think, when we actually look at this example here. All right, keeping in mind that the variances occur because of volume differences and price or cost differences, let's take a look at this budget. We have Terrapin Systems Corporation preparing its annual business plan for 2018. The organization anticipated it would sell 10,000 units. So that's the master budget, 10,000 units of its product, and they're expecting to sell at $15 each. Its contribution margin percentage is 20%. What does that mean? Well, a contribution margin just means the amount that you receive over and above the revenue minus the variable expenses. So if your selling price, let's say, is $15, Okay, that's what you're expecting to sell for. If you had, let's say, a uh, cost of the variable cost, cost per unit that varies with production of three, your contribution margin is 12. So it's the selling price minus the variable cost equals the contribution margin. The contribution margin percentage is your contribution margin divided by your selling price. And that's a measure of your profitability. So if I took the 12 over the 15 here, that means that the percentage profit I make on each sale, gross profit, before I pay out my other expenses, my fixed costs, would be 12 divided by 15, about 80%, right? So in other words, we'd say contribution margin, every dollar I sell, I keep 80 cents to pay my fixed costs, my variable costs are already accounted for because again, it's selling price minus variable costs. So this is the budget they're estimating. Here are the fixed costs, operating income. Budgeted, actual variance. So if you look over this budget, you would say, well, they made $150,000 in revenue budget. I'm sorry, the budget was 150. They actually earned only 112. So they have a negative variance here. There's something wrong with that, right? That's unfavorable. We were aiming for revenue of 150, but the revenue only 112, unfavorable. Now I might say to you, okay, why did that happen? Why did that happen? Can you tell by looking at it? You can kind of maybe guess, right? Oh, I don't know. Did they sell the number of units they were supposed to sell or did they sell at the price they're supposed to sell at, right? I don't know. But remember, price, cost, or volume. It's the only reasons why you'd have differences in these numbers, but I can't tell why that revenue figure is lower than it budgeted. I don't know. What about the variable cost? That actually looks good, doesn't it? Favorable. But this can be, remember I told you managerial accounting can be misleading? That can be very misleading because remember, this budget is based on manufacturing 10,000 units, but the actual number of units sold were only eight. And that's the number they manufactured. So this number of 120 is based on manufacturing 10,000 units and selling them. If they only sold, if they only manufactured 8,000 units, and that cost him 120,000. I don't know. What should it have cost him? Not 100, not 100, uh, I'm sorry, 100,800 is the actual, right? So I was assuming they were going to manufacture 10,000 units in the master budget, and that would be the cut budgeted cost. They came below it, but they manufactured 2,000 fewer units. So I'm really comparing by comparing the master budget against the actual performance level, 10,000 units versus 8,000, right? 10,000 here versus 8,000. I'm comparing apples and oranges. The fixed cost shouldn't change at all based on production. So that looks okay. Because remember we said, doesn't matter how many units you manufacture, your fixed costs don't move. 
So here we actually saved a thousand. Some, somehow we managed to save a thousand. That that that's fine. But wherever the numbers are determined based on a level of production or sales, this budget is inadequate. We're comparing apples and oranges. Hence the flexible budget. The flexible budget compares apples and apples. And then um, at two different levels. We have over here our actual results. Well, we only sold 8,000 units, right? The flexible budget is the master budget, but reduced to 8,000 units, the actual level of performance. So the actual results, we sold and manufactured 8,000 units. The flexible budget is at actual planned cost, meaning it's what the master budget would have looked at had we manufactured and sold 8,000 units. So if you look down here, notice that when it comes to the variable costs, the flexible budget said, well, those 8,000 units should have cost 96,000. They cost us 100,000. The uh, actual was 100,800. That's an unfavorable variance, 4,800. Contribution margin likewise. So we can see the flexible budget variances, we call them unfavorable 11,800 by comparing apples and apples. 8,000 units of manufactured sales based upon the master budget if the master budget were scaled at 8,000. Then remember we said price volume or price cost versus volume differences. So what this measures really are price and cost differences. That's really what the flexible budget measures. At 8,000, what should these things have cost us? What should we sell, have sold at? Notice that the actual results were sales of 112,000. Supposed to be 120. The flexible budget variance is eight. Why is that different? Well, we didn't sell at the price we thought we were gonna sell at. That's gonna measure the price and cost differences, cost versus price. Now what we do is we produce the master budget at 10,000 and we measure the differences. This is the flexible budget at planned cost, what these things should have been at 8,000 units. Master budget, what they should have been at 10,000. What this measures is volume differences. So in other words, we sold 2,000 fewer units. Well, what should we at planned sales price have gotten? Well, the answer is 6,000 more unfavorable variants. So flexible budgets are very useful to flesh out why you have budget variances. On the one hand, it can be cost related, price related, right? So we can look and see what those differences are based on the actual level of production versus planned at actual level. And then we can also measure the differences resulting from pure volume, which is the difference between the flexible budget at actual plan cost and the master budget at planned uh, volume, in this particular case, 10,000. The flexible budget measuring the price cost differences, the, um, the flexible budget variances rather, and the volume variances measuring the difference strictly due to volume. And that's budgeting. So I mean, obviously we covered a lot and I do it mainly just to introduce you to the wonderful world of managerial accounting uh, and highly recommend that it be an area that you include on your uh, study list uh, for your business because this, this really is a, is, is a terrific, uh, source of tools to help you manage your business, make good decisions, useful, effective decisions uh, with respect to uh, all aspects of your business. We didn't cover areas like break-even analysis where you can actually figure out at what point your company needs to break even in terms of sales. That's very helpful because that sets your risk profile, right? The closer you are to your break-even, the less, the more risk averse you want to be, the more cushion you have, you have a cushion way above your break-even analysis. 
uh, you're going to be a little bit more aggressive because you could lose sales, your budget could be off if you want to experiment or uh, play around. So <clears throat> all these topics are covered in managerial. And these are the ones I wanted to pull out to show you how you can use or be aware of these issues in connection with uh, the operation of your business. Um, okay, so that's basically what I wanted to cover. Any, any questions or anything else you want me to, to mention? Either everybody fell asleep or... <laughs> it's been a pleasure. I hope that you've enjoyed the uh, three webinars. I think, uh, Michelle, we record, I guess they're going to be recording. Uh, I don't know if they, if they post the first one or not. Um, but uh, it's, um, you know, I think among the three, again, it's intended to sort of, from the standpoint of the non-COVID related, which accounting really, as you can see, really hasn't changed that much. It's really more from a tax perspective and from the loan reimbursement perspective, um, uh, you know, what, what's relevant uh, to, to us. Accounting really hasn't changed significantly, but I think these are, again, areas that um, both from financial accounting, from a lending perspective, understanding accrual accounting concepts, financial accounting from a management perspective, understanding managerial accounting, and then um, on the tax aspects and the loan reimbursement, that would be the more applicable to the COVID. So um, if there are no further questions, again, I thank all of you for attending and spending your time. I know, as I mentioned, the first webinar, I guess when you, when, when you told your staff or colleagues that you would be unavailable between 3 and 4.30 and they asked you what you were doing and you told them you were attending an accounting webinar, they must have been so, so envious. I can't imagine. They must have thought, wow, how do I get in on something like that? So it's been my pleasure and I wish all of you the best of luck. Thanks so thanks, much. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot, uh, uh, Gene. I think we got a lot of positive comments. People found it uh, very helpful. Great. Uh, there's a question, can we get the presentation deck uh, copy? Um, and also there was a question about the materials from last uh, uh, last webinar, which I couldn't uh, uh, access so quickly. So people can just send me or maybe you an email and we'll, we'll distribute those uh, materials uh, uh, again. So, so once again, I, I'd really like to thank uh, Professor Gene Cantor for the extremely insightful webinars. Sure especially this one on, on, on managerial accounting and, and you know, the, the many simple examples that you use and often funny examples to, to illustrate the concept. This concludes the, the three-part accounting series for the program. We really hope that you, uh, that you found it useful. Uh, last week, we had a webinar with Andy uh, Shalal. I don't know if you had the chance to, to listen on that one. But he was asked about the one most important uh, uh, topic in business that you should know about. He mentioned uh, uh, accounting. Uh, so everyone, please note that uh, once again, the recordings for today's lecture and the previous webinars are available for you to watch on the Maryland Rebooted website. The previous two webinars uh, by, uh, by Gene Cantor were posted uh, already. We'll post this one as soon as we have it uh, ready. And before we want to let you go, we. Also, uh, quickly want to share some exciting upcoming webinars. In the next week, Professor Mary Harms will give a series of webinars on digital marketing. So please uh, tune in and register for, for the website. Also, if you're interested in a deeper understanding of these specific topics, check out Maryland's MicroMasters program series. It offers a longer and more in-depth sessions, which are also offered uh, for free and again, the links are provided on the website. So the Maryland Rebe Rebooted Program is uh, offered by the R.H. Smith School of Business at the University of Maryland in an effort to help Maryland state residents, small and medium-sized business owners to navigate the uh, economic effects of uh, COVID-19. And we sincerely hope that this webinar series will help you uh, during these uh, difficult times. So once again, Thank you everybody for attending and we hope to see you in the next series of webinars.